Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about oil recovery factors. So this is another one of my basic primer series, so it's a quick overview for people who are non-experts to understand what uh, geologists and petroleum engineers and geophysicists talk about. So we've got the volumetric equation. So total recoverable volume would be gross rock volume by net to gross, by porosity, by saturation, by formation volume factor, and then this in-place volume is then multiplied by, by something called the recovery factor. Now, the recovery factor is a portion of hydrocarbon in place that will be recovered through field life. And some hydrocarbons will always be left behind. You're never going to get it all out. And typically, recovery factors between 10 and 60% for oil fields, now very dependent on a lot of factors, which I'll go through, and between 15 and 80% for gas fields. And recovery factors depend on a lot of things, reservoir geology, fluid type, and development technologies fundamentally. So key point to bear in mind is that the recovery factor is not a measurable number. It's not like porosity, it's not like saturation, it's not like net to gross, it's not like volume, you can't measure it. You infer it because it's a ratio of two estimates. So the top line is a predicted recoverable volume, or the EUR, and the bottom line is the estimated hydrocarbon in place. And you don't really 100% know either of them. You estimate them. Now, why is it useful? Well, it's useful in estimating uh, potential recoverable volumes in prospects and in while well, you're appraising discoveries in the early stage. It's also useful for benchmarking field performance, so how well is your field doing to other, uh, compared to other similar fields. A little bit about how recoverable volume is estimated through field life. So at the exploration stage, you tend to use multiple scenarios for limited constraint, and that's where recovery factors tend to, tend to take place. You also use type curves at this stage, particularly for unconventionals. I'm not going to talk much about unconventionals. It's not something I've had that much experience in. When you're building an appraisal stage, the more data you get, you start building geological models and you start building a reservoir simulator model, which actually gives you a real production or a realistic estimate of a production profile. As you develop, you get more data, gain more complicated reservoir modeling. And then when you start producing, you start getting real production data. So you can now build a history match. You can match your model to the realistic data and you get a much better estimate. But when you're at the product and the um, exploration appraisal stage, you don't have any of that. So you have to make a lot of guesses. When you're in a uh, exploration stage, you tend to do things stochastically. So you would tend to put distributions of various uh, parameters, a low, mid, and high with the distribution. You multiply a whole bunch of stochastic parameters and skew you, skew you, I'm not normal, etc. cetera. Um, but again, different uh, people use different parameters. So what does recovery factor depend on? So you want a good recovery factor. Kind of helps having a large volume. It helps having a large porosity, particularly if you've got large grains and large pores. And also homogeneity helps. Larger reservoir bodies help particularly if they've got high conductivity. So you're looking at a tank. High permeability helps, but beware of high perm streaks, particularly if you've got water drive. You can have early water breakthrough or gas breakthrough, which is a bad thing. Compartmentalization will be low with few faults, some interlayer conductivity, and lighter fluids tend to help, less viscous fluids. What a poor recovery factor. Well, you kind of want to have small volumes because then you have less than uh, in terms of drive. Low porosity, that really helps take it down. Smaller grains, Low homogeneity, more heterogeneity. Smaller bodies, thin beds, small channels with high heterogeneity and low connectivity. You get a labyrinth, you know, with a minotaur in the middle of it. Low permeability helps. More compartmentalization, more faults, more fault damage zones, barriers, baffles, vertical interlayer barriers, seals, and heavy oils. So you want a tank, you really don't want a labyrinth. And this is an example from an oil field that I worked on during my career. So you have big fat channel, 100% sand, main channel fasces, and then you get overbank fasces on the side. With the channel, you have production wells in the middle. Uh, this is the all water contact, which is a common contact for the whole field. So everything talks to each other in geological time, although not in production time by any means. So you get pressure support from two uh, injector wells. You get some producers in here, everybody happy. Excellent pressure support. Recovery factor for this block was around 60% of our volume, our volume place estimates. Pretty damn good. Here, not so much. So you have the overbank fasces, you have little channels, little crevasse plays. They kind of all connect to each other in geological time, but definitely not in production time. So you put an injector here that does not support these producers. Very low, limited local recovery factors of about 10%. So 
we kind of gave up on this bit because we just couldn't make it work effectively. But this bit more than paid for everything. So that gives you effective facies. Fluids also help. So this is a fluid phase diagram for gas, liquid, two-phase gas and liquid. You kind of, you have different recovery factors for different things. And the key thing to bear in mind, particularly if you're in the gas phase, is you get constant dropout. Particularly if you get a downhole, that's a bit of a problem. If you get uh, degasification, when you go take the uh, oil uh, reservoir below bubble point, you get uh, also get problems. So you want to keep pressure up if you possibly can. So a little bit about drive mechanisms within oil fields. So the worst one to have is this one. So you have an isolated oil body. It's got gas dissolved in it. You take the pressure down, gas dissolves out, and that uh, works a bit, a little bit like a soda bottle. So if you take a soda can, open it up, it goes fizz. That's basically what this is. Alternatively, if your oil reservoir is below bubble point, you get a separate gas cap or a gas cap in an oil rim. The gas cap starts expanding as you uh, as you uh, as you lower the pressure. You know, PV equals NRT. Remember that from high school physics. And this bears down onto the oil, and you're trying to get this produced. Now, another oil field I worked on, we had this exact situation, and the regulator in the country I was working on was very worried about us, us blowing down the gas cap and losing energy within the system. So you have to be very careful with our gas production rates. You have to be very careful where we allocate the horizontal producers within the relatively thin oil rim. Uh, this is a good one. We have an edge water, have a big aquifer, and that gives you uh, pressure here. And this is quite often where you have pressure support from water injection. So you have a water injector pumping down water, keeping this thing high, and an oil producer here. And then you have a combination drive where you've got a gas cap, you've got a water leg underneath, and this is using to squeeze the oil. So this is another way of looking at it. So how do you decide production methods? Well, you've got a reservoir model, you understand what the drive is, or you think you do. So the key thing here is to maximize your economic recovery. Basically, you get the best bang for your buck. So you've got to understand geology and fluids, what's possible, economic value, because we're here to make money. Will the extra investment lead to commensurate growth returns? If it doesn't, then you don't do it. Then your company experience, what can we accomplish with the contractors? You know, if it's something that's new and novel, that's a bit of a risk. And then the government regulators. And most of the world outside um, USA, uh, the regulator bodies have to approve development plans, including infill enhancements. You have quite a much more intense relationships with these people, particularly if you're in production sharing contracts. So again, you have to come together to come up with a development plan that everybody's happy with. So how do you develop stuff? Well, primary one is depletion. Basically, it's like uh, putting a straw and sucking. So the reservoir is a high pressure, surface is obviously low pressure, and eventually the fluids will come out. Um, when the pressure differential tends to decline, you tend to put things like pumping, lifting compressions. That's when you put things like an odding donkey. Later on, uh, in oil fields, you have pressure maintenance. So effectively what you do is you inject water underneath or inject gas into the system to try to keep the pressure high. And then you have tertiary enhanced methods, so steam, CO2, detergent floods, etc., which I've never worked on. I don't fully 100% understand. Again, you choose different ones that are there. Now, these are two production profiles. So this is a profile for a field produced by depletion. What you can see is that you get reduction in production rate. So this is production rate, this is time for each of the individual uh, development uh, units. And eventually it'll just blow down completely. This is a production uh, plot for a reservoir with a water flood. So the green is oil, blue is water. And effectively what you do is you keep the production rate similar for the total fluids, but the portion of water or the water cut increases with time. Obviously that is something you need to deal with. You, the water needs to be treated before disposal in an environmentally sound manner, which is something you just built into the system. Offshore, that's not a problem. Uh, onshore, it's a bit more of a problem. So what do you get in typical oil recovery factors? So low, mid, and high. So with depletion, with lifting, pumping, etc., 10% is a low case, 20% mid case, 30% is a high case. With pressure support from water injection, you know, it's not really working out 20%, mid case 35%, maybe up to 40, and the 45, maybe up to 50 for high. Hard soil recovery, 35, 50, 60. So that gives you a range of what typical oil recovery factors are. And this is from APG Wiki. So this is what happens in terms of pressure with produced oil. 
So in solution gas dry falls off fairly rapidly because you're effectively sucking out a very close system. With gas cap drive, again, falls off, um, but um, there's no pressure maintenance, so effectively you're capped out about here, about 30, 35% of thereabouts. With water drive, you can get up to, you can get it into the 50s or the 60s with a lot of luck. Typically, you'll be around 40-ish, 35-ish, but again, the pressure is uh, maintained, and effectively you get voidage replacement by water, but you just produce more water. And the gas oil ratio, solution gas drive, comes up very high as the uh, bubbles, uh, as the gas comes out in bubbles, and then drops off again as you basically run out of energy. With gas cap drive, it just keeps on going, 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 because you basically produce some, produce the gas, but that loses energy in the whole system. With water drive, it's kind of constant because your pressure is kept high. Uh, when you're coming to gas fields, you tend to produce things primarily by depletion. Uh, so this is a profile of a gas field, and then it just declines. So pressure declines, gas production rate declines. Eventually, that's what ends everything. You will, uh, at some point, install compressors. So these effectively are jet engines that act as a giant sucking sound to lift the fluid um, on the production platform. And in some gas fields, particularly ones with very rich condensate, you would do gas cycling. So effectively, you would produce the gas, uh, the total fluid. You strip out the condensate at the processing plant and you shove the gas back into the reservoir to try to maintain pressure. And uh, you can do uh, use the processing plant to recover the liquids and you can recover the gas later. Some people do this for seasonality. So, for example, if you have very low gas demand in summer, high gas demand in winter, but you want to keep more money, make money from the um, from the gas condensate, you can re-inject in the in the in the summer um, and produce gas in the winter as well. So that's one way of doing it. So typical gas rates are a lot higher because gas rate gas is a lot more permeable and relative permeability to, to liquids. So typically for dry gas, mid, mid case about 65, low case about 50, 55, high case about 75, 80. As tops out about that, maybe up to 85, the very, very, very best, but that's about what you're going to get. For wet gas condensate, again, uh, danger of condensate banking if the condensate drops out in the reservoir. 50% low case, 60% mid case, 65-ish, 70% perhaps high case. So you can also use this for benchmarking. So this is from the uh, Oil and Gas Authority, now the North Sea Transition Authority, the government regulating the UK. And you've got Fuel Quality Index, which is their measure of how complex the reservoir is. Look at the website to get the details of that. It's, it's uh, There's quite a lot in there. And then recovery factors. So again, you can get some relatively high recovery factors for... Um, relatively low complexity high quality reservoirs and yet low recovery factors for you know low complexity reservoirs and also going through time so these are fields developed in the 1970s 1980s that tend to have higher recovery factors and then tend to go a bit lower um, so from the mid 40s to the mid 30s um, through time uh, the reason for that is that these fields tend to be smaller and more complicated because we've done the big, big easy ones first so sum up recovery factors are a portion of the in place volume that can be recovered in the lifetime now it's an artificial construct you can't measure it it's a ratio of two numbers so ideally you'll create a reservoir model produce production profile when you have enough data but that's a bit of a challenge at the prospect stage because you still need to have a range of numbers to make an economic decision so that's where you use a recovery factor which you use basically built from analogs so just as a rough rule of thumb for prospects uh, again, based on reservoir quality, fluid types, production method. So all depletion, poor 10%, mid 20%, good 30%. Press support, poor 20%, mid 35%, good 45%. Dry gas, 55, 65, 75. Wet constant, 50, 60, 70, 65. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.